the second is like the first to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. If I truly, truly love my neighbor, like then again, how am I honoring that female? If I'm claiming to love my neighbor, if it's just like the first, which is loving your God with all your heart and all your soul. What's up, fam? So today, fun facts, we actually have a podcast swap. Uh, if you guys did not know, I was on Jeremy's Golf and Gospel episode uh, where he plays nine holes with someone who's a Christian. Uh, you play, you know, a competition, and he also does an interview along the way, which was super, super fun. We talked about cohabitation. We talked about crossing boundaries. We talked about what it looks like to have accountability in your life, how I got to the place I am in my life. So we had an awesome time. And uh, did he beat me? I know that's your question. Did he beat me? Well, you're going to have to go over there and check it out. And so, yes, uh, we had a great time. Fun fact, I drove to Phoenix uh, at uh, five o'clock on a Friday night. This was before we had our baby. And uh, I was like, hey, I'm not going to have many more opportunities to do this. So just hop in my car, drive five hours somewhere, play around the golf and then drive back. So yeah, I got that out of the way. This is my gift to you as single guys. Hey, if there's a guy trip, if there's a hike, if there's anything that you've been postponing, get in your car and and do it, knock it out. Please have that fun because once you get married, once you have a kid, yeah, those days are gone. Okay, so enjoy them while you can. Uh, I know you guys are already doing that, but here's your little nudge and push. Before we jump in, all I have today is in my DMs, and here is the question. Hey, JJ, thank you so much. I love the podcast. Uh, I know you talk a lot about asking girls out and how to shoot your shot. Uh, there's a girl in my friend group at church who I've had a crush on for a while, and I just don't know if it's a good time to ask her out or not. Please help. Okay, I love the uh, I love the ask. Um, listen, man, this is like the story of every <laughs> single man and woman who's been in church, and there's been other like people of the opposite sex. Like you develop. Uh, you know, attraction over time, especially as you see character, you see who they are. Um, there's girls who maybe you were not attracted to at first that you now find yourself attracted to and you have an awesome friend group. I, I've been there. I think we've all been there. I would just say, number one, um, you know, our hope and vision is that you can date well and you can date so healthily in a church that if you did ask her out and you guys did maybe go three or four dates, what if you dated in such a way that after you saw her three or four dates later, and it didn't work out, did you date her in such a way that when you see her next Sunday or you see her at group, it's not awkward? Did you leave her better than you found her? Did you respect physical boundaries, emotional boundaries, spiritual boundaries? Did you date well? And if you if you see her and there's a ton of emotional baggage and trauma and it's dramatic, you know, to the degree that you can control, um, I would say it's a really good indicator of how you're dating and how you're treating her, obviously to to within your control. So yeah, I would say ask her out because the worst case scenario is that you could just continue to have a church crush, a, a foundationship with her for weeks and weeks and months and months. And, you know, that crush is just developed and blossomed into something so big that you can't go to church. You can't go to community group without being distracted by her. And when those distractions are, are bigger than our relationship with God, and I've been there, you know, I've been to a church service where for the hour and a half I was there, you know, an hour and 15 minutes, I was just consumed in thinking and checking her out and watching her worship and thinking about what I should say to her after church and blah, blah, blah. And the the biggest loser in that situation was me and my relationship with God, which was the most important thing in my life. So if that's happened to you, I would just say you've definitely come up to a point where that is the worst scenario, best case scenario, right? Is just that you ask her out and you get a yes or a no. Uh, and that's the best case scenario. You ask her out, find out and see if it's a yes or a no. And then you move on with your life. That is the best case scenario versus the alternative of just distracted, distracted, distracted by a church crush who doesn't really know that you like her or not. Okay. So I love you, bro. I know that ask out is hard, but have courage. You can do it. Shoot your shot. Your identity, your worth, your value doesn't rest on the fact that she says yes or no. 
You got this, bro. So let's get it. I hope you guys enjoy the episode and I'll see you guys next week. Let's go. What's up, fam? It's your boy, JJ. Jer, what's good, man? Call me Jerm. Jerm? I only let my wife call me Jer. Oh, uh, okay. Wait, so we're so I was going to say we're not on Jer terms yet, but... Call me Jerm, though. Jerm. Okay, Jerm. What's good, bro? Good, man. Out here in lovely Arizona. Happy that you came out here to visit me, man. Just here to kick it. Thank you for having me on the show, bro. Yeah. Getting into some discussion. Well, this is kind of like a last minute decision, all of it. So I hopped in my car last night at what I think like six o'clock. Something crazy. Yeah. Like, Are you really about to leave? It was further than I thought. I got I started driving and I realized Arizona and Phoenix is six hours away. Yeah. And in my mind, <laughs> it was like four and a half. You think they were neighbors, but then you got another two hours once you get into Phoenix into Arizona to get to Phoenix. I know. And the worst part is I drove at night. Mm. So I drove through like Joshua Tree, mm-hmm. Palm Springs, all these awesome places. Couldn't see nothing. Can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> so before we jump into the episode, icebreaker question for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so every guy this, and it's always interesting. Okay. Would you rather, and you're a big guy, oh, shoot. you're jacked, okay. pretty strong. Your bench, Smart. maxed out bench was 405. In college, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. Would you rather fight an ostrich to the death okay. or would you rather fight a shark, but the worst thing that can happen is you either kill the shark or you lose a limb. So shark is like, you got to kill the shark. It's in a pool. So there's shallow and deep end. If you lose, you don't die. You can only just lose a limb. But the ostrich, it's fight to the death. The thing is, I don't know the ramifications of fighting an ostrich. I know they're super fast. I know they can get going. I don't know how agile they are. Like, can I? Am I able to get behind him and jump on his neck? And I don't know how strong they are. So I mean, they can run like sixty miles per yeah, hour. I, I'm not outrunning them, so I'm just trying to be agile and like get on his back because they only have what two legs, right? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I only have two. Now, Can you I, imagine I, one with four? <laughs> right. I think I would take the ostrich, but I know with sharks, because I'm a huge turtle guy, as y'all can see. This is a turtle, guys. This is a turtle. That when turtles are encounter sharks, that they they go to the shallow end on purpose. And the shark is less agile, and then the turtle typically beats the shark, and then the shark runs away. But I'm not a turtle. I can't swim. So I'm going to take the ostrich. I'm going to take the ostrich. I'm going to take the ostrich. Yeah. Uh, that was like a little planet earth you know uh documentary recap right there yeah i didn't know that they did that yes i actually remember seeing it on maybe discovery channel something i was like man see turtles are like that bro we could beat a shark wait wait so you grew up and you saw the i like turtles kid did that was that like a was that like a defining moment of your childhood uh i'm (laughs) I was like, man, this kid is me in heart. But I, I fell in love with turtles. <laughs> Minus in fourth the zombie grade. face yeah. pit. I fell in love with turtles in fourth grade. And uh, obviously, I have two tortoises now. Love them a lot. But yeah, I just always been a turtle guy. Can you give the camera your best impression of that kid? Oh, I like turtles. <laughs> <laughs> I usually do an intro mm-hmm. where I pull up all the stats, mm-hmm. I hype you up. Do you want me to do that? Or do you want to just give, like, you know, a 10, 20 second, who you are. 10, 20 seconds, man. Okay, right. then you got it. Jeremy Davis with the Norcross High School, Norcross, Georgia. Shout out to the Blue Devils. Went to the University of Connecticut where I played with the Huskies. Go Huskies. Was fortunate to be drafted in the sixth round by the New York Giants. Yes. Uh, grateful for that just to see my name be called. Did a year and a half there. A lot of hamstring issues throughout my career, but did a year and a half there. Ended up going to the Chargers, which was amazing. Met one of my best friends, Tyrell Williams there as my dog. Then had a cup of coffee with Detroit, and now I coach high school football. I train receivers, and I have a dope YouTube channel called Golf and Gospel. I love it. You know, should we tell them how we met? Yeah, it's actually funny. I don't remember the name of the specific app. What was it? It's Golf called Golf Link. Golf Link. It's like Tinder for golf. And but it's platonic. 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 <laughs> of obviously, course. Obviously, obviously. Of obviously. course, it's platonic. Yes. And uh, yeah, you found me on there, bro. Saw your believer, how hype you were for just seeing the title golf and gospel because it wasn't really that fire like it is now. And then obviously you hit me up. And then I met you on accident 
in the airport. This is Dubai, crazy. Which is crazy. We are both bragging. You know, you're still dating. You're now wife. Mm-hmm. And I was telling Kate, like, we we match. Sparks kind of flew. And we were both excited, you know, maybe a little infatuated <laughs> with each other. And uh, all of a sudden, literally like a rom-com movie, mm-hmm. I get off the flight in Phoenix and standing right there in the gate, like right there, it's like the halo light from heaven is shining down. I see Jeremy and I was like, and I was, I was unsure, right? Yeah. Cause I'm like, you could, I didn't want to just walk up to you cause you're a tall black guy with dreads yes. and be like, are yeah. you Jeremy? You know? I get that. I get it. <laughs> so, but I was like, I was like, Jeremy? <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot. JJ. JJ. Yeah. What's yeah. Up, bro? So and that probably happened like what, in a few days from. It was literally like a week later. Yeah, that was quick. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. And our wives were like, so this is the guy you were telling me about. Yes. God just told my <laughs> wife about the app and how it's Tinder like ish, but it's like to meet golfers. So I was trying to see if I can find other golfers that were also believers to golf with, which technically I did with you. You just live in a different state. Yeah. Uh, but now it worked out. Yeah. So we locked eyes. <laughs> yes. Our wives saw the connection and we had to just reassured it's platonic babe. Yes. It's, it's platonic. <laughs> Absolutely. so Absolutely. that was so cool um and then we're gonna be moving to tennessee so i was like you know i'm about to have a baby here yes let me just hop in this car real quick yes. it's six hours a yes. long six hours yes. but let's get let's get it in yes so i'm playing jeremy this afternoon and yes. his channel golf and gospel, golf and gospel yes. which if you could just maybe tell it, i know it's sick but and it's pretty self-explanatory. I read the title and I was like, okay, I assume yeah. this is what it is and sure. it is. But you play nine holes yes. competitively. Yes. Try to yes. against caddies, golfers, pro athletes. Yep. Yeah. The thing that's awesome, like I said, and I always put this out there, like I show no partiality on my channel. So you can be a pro golfer, pro NFL player, NBA player, or you can be a, a local high school teacher down the street. If you want and love to share the gospel and you know how to golf, come slide, bro. Because I'm probably going to repeat myself here with this, but I always say the priority of the channel is the gospel. Amen. The competition is second, but obviously me being so competitive in nature, it's like trying to capture this dub. And uh, obviously with the channel too, we talk about a lot of things, music, food, lots of topics. Me and my boy Torrance, shout out to my boy T-Way, we break down you know, PGA uh, matches and stuff like that, who we think we're going to win. So it's a lot, but the gospel will be shared. It's amazing. I mean, it's... Um... <laughs> I just think about everything we do and how maybe there's like, we try to creatively send the gospel, find a vehicle to yeah. talk about it, yeah. which is amazing. But sometimes we get so caught up in that. Yes. It's like we lose the mission that we were here in the first uh, place, right? Yes. yes Isn't that so funny? Yeah. Yeah, it is, bro. And and that's one thing I got to keep reminding myself as I'm playing. It's like, yeah, I want to get birds. I want to get pars. I want to win matches. But, you know, the, the word is... The same yesterday, today, and forever, bro. Yeah. And I want to make sure to emphasize that each time, even if I miss a putt for double bogey. Yeah. You know, my, my, my game's going to change, but it's where it doesn't. So. Yeah. I love, well, I just love the fact that it's, hey, no matter what happens, my top priority today mm-hmm. is sharing the gospel. Yes. And it's so easy to get caught up in my workout at the gym, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to lunch. I'm just grabbing a quick coffee. Mm-hmm. I'm like, to have my heart actually be fixated and everything I do revolve around the idea of sharing the gospel is super cool because I don't know. I feel like, you know, we were just talking about that, um, you know, cashier at the donut shop. Yes. Yes. I know you cheated today and I'm outing you, Yes, yes, but you were walking away, but you were walking away from her. Like, I wonder what, I wonder if she's a Christian, Yeah. you know, and uh, just like every single interaction. Why is this not the top of my heart? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think for me, not necessarily because I know in scripture it says always being ready to prepare a defense for why you believe because it wasn't a defense moment, but like how can I organically ask this question in regards to the faith? And that takes intentionality because yes. I think some people are like, I want it to be so organic. Yes. I'm going to wait, wait, wait. Right. Might never see her again. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, so, don't know if it's all right. I might, I might go back. Yes. Yeah. But there's got to be like, it's not ever going to be that perfect organic moment yes. where they ask you like something quasi-spiritual right. and you're like this is a perfect opening for me to right. talk about jesus yeah. now i think there's the relational evangelical nature where you mm-hmm. become friends with someone over yes. time yes but there is also those other end of the spectrum i'm probably not gonna see this guy again yeah. i'm thinking about the chic gas station clerk last night who had christian right. music playing in his gas station yeah, yeah, yeah. and i asked him about it and he's like no i'm a chic but they're all the same anyway yeah. to me i'm like 
why do you say that? You right. know, and like that kind of opening mm-hmm. to be like, well, hey, I'll be honest. I used to think that, mm. but then I met Jesus. Yeah. And I think you should look into that. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Is that just like seed evangelism, right? Just like scattering seed? Is that yeah. how you view it? Yeah. I mean, obviously you want to plant the seed, but it, sometimes it's very difficult because obviously we have a heart that really, really, really wants to see people come to Christ. But I always say it's tough because the same way as we should be are so devout and devoted to our faith, like though they are too. So it's like, man, I, I hope the seed that was just planted, you know, eventually sprouts and they do surrender. Yeah. Will we ever know? On earth, we won't, but we hope that we're doing our jobs as believers and planting seed and then just praying for that seed to grow. Now, as you look at, and I love the fact that you just got married mm-hmm. three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Right. <laughs> yes. This house is still being put together. Yeah. Your poor wife like apologizes every hour on the hour. That's her sorry, man. She's a sweetheart, though. You know, and as guys, right, interior decor is such a big deal to us. <laughs> like, I can't believe walking around yeah. this place. Yeah. It's halfway set up. Right. <laughs> I love those memes where yeah. it's like, the perfect guy's living room and it's just like a lawn chair yeah, and a TV, <laughs> a and TV. A yeah. yeah. And then it's like the cardboard box is the, from the TV is the, the bed, coffee table or, or the bed. Yeah. yeah it's so funny. Yes. Yes. I'm like, that's all we need sometimes. Yeah. But okay. So, but your single life, mm-hmm. you've been single way longer than you've been married, right? Right. You yeah. can think about marriage advice, mm-hmm. but you can talk about your single life. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, as far as, the man you are today, sharing the gospel, right? I heard the way that you dated Erica, mm-hmm. really, really awesome with boundaries, yeah. really, really kept God as the focal mm-hmm. point. Yeah. Were you always that way? I, or... was, I would say I, I've always had the intentions and failed a lot. Um, the thing that was so beautiful about obviously dating Erica is the friends that I've gained that were great, great accountability partners. Like I said, People will see the connection me and my boy Torrance have, like on golf and gospel, or just in real life, and think we've known each other for years. Yeah, me and Torrance probably known each other two and a half, three years. Okay, but he was so huge in like encouraging me to obviously stay abstinent, to make sure I'm not spending the night, uh, make sure I'm at the apartment at night. Like that was huge, and it was super huge. And also my pastor Will Sullivan, and I always thought to myself, man, if I fell and sleep with Erica, to confess that to my pastor and now that we didn't it feels amazing that i can confident before obviously before we we're married i can confidently tell my pastor like yeah we good we, we did nothing <laughs> you know that is a, a, a i love that feeling and then obviously lastly most important so honoring that you know that we were obedient in our holiness and and that even led to fights right oh, yes, like at the yes, and this yes. is like i love how vulnerable you were in sharing but yeah even walking out to the point at what nine o'clock at night, yes, yeah, so like uh, I can't even cuddle. Yeah, we would, I will always leave by 10. It was one time I didn't because we were watch, watching the finale of Big Brother. We okay, love Big brother, but yeah, usually 10 o'clock is like okay, I gotta leave. And we were getting so many fights because she wants me to stay longer and cuddle, and I'm always like, bro, I gotta drive 20 <laughs> minutes, you already in the comfort of your house, and then like I just it just became a thing. And then truthfully, it was it was sexual frustration because like we weren't able to express that on one another right um so yeah it, we it, the the air was very sensitive i would say that much but um like i said it was it was so beautiful that we can tell a story saying like oh yeah man me, me, my wife waited bro like it was cool and along like my homeboy t way i know his wife they waited so it's just, it's, it feels good to have a community that's done that and also most importantly that um we were like i said obedient in our holiness to god now, so what, but what happened, like, because I think we can have all the intent in the mm-hmm. world sure. and you might have before Erica and in your past mm-hmm. had of all, had all the intent in the world to respect mm-hmm. sexual boundaries, purity, mm-hmm. and, you know, like really, really want to honor God, yeah. honor her and honor yourself. Mm-hmm. But then when it comes down to action time, yeah. you know, what, what happens to all, all that intent? Does it just disappear? Like, does it, were you not really say, intentional or I like think it disappears? What? I think the intention was always there. One thing my pastor talked about is like, man, we love praying for tangible stuff, but we never want to pray for fruits of the spirit. And we look in Galatians five it says fruits of the spirit. One of them is self-control. And I never really, really intentionally asked for that. So every time I got into that situation, it's just like, man, my self-control is, is not there. Or it's like, I'll flee the first time. The second time, it's like, if I let my flesh get the best of me, I got to know. I got to know. 
And the thing that really sucks about that, I told, I just told my boy Tyrell this story not too long ago. I told him this many times, but he always forgets how one time, like a while ago, you know, I slept with this chick and whatnot. And I remember after she was like, I didn't expect the man of God to do that. And that crushed me. That was convicting because now all I'm thinking is like, I ruined the witness for her. And let's say a guy who is surrendered to the Lord pursues her. She's going to be like, what does that mean to me? A guy like him who supposedly boasts in the Lord did this to me. So why should I believe you? And that is me lacking being salt and light. So ever since that moment, man, it's been very, very convicting because I had no self-control. And the curiosity of the flesh is what really got me. Dang, man. She said that? Yeah, that hurt me, bro. That And, and I deserve that. In the that. best way. I deserve that. I mean, I deserve I, that. Yeah. Yeah, I and, really did. In the best way. Mm -hmm. I can't think of um of a more just like, hey, you claim to be this. And and look what happened. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, you. So you felt like that was kind of the moment that just like, kind of came crashing down on you. Like, man, there's something in my life and about this faith yeah. that I claim to have that's not lining up with the life that I'm living. Yeah, yeah. I like me and my boy Torrance said. We always say I wasn't locked in. I was not locked in. Uh, I would say before that moment, what I was doing when I was, you know mess around, sleeping around. So I was trying to mask the pain of a relationship I had in the past where we both told each other, committed to abstinence. And then I come to figure out like a year later that she was sleeping around with this guy. Wow. So then that hurt. And I'm like, well, you know what? I didn't get to enjoy college like that. So I'm going to enjoy it now. So I kind of like try to put uh... my face in my back pocket when I was in public. But then around teammates and stuff, it's like, oh, yeah, I believe in Christ, which one thing you said earlier, which I do indeed think is true. It's like my salvation was always there, but my holiness wasn't. So uh, I was trying to be very secretive because I was trying to mask the pain of what happened to me in college, you know, through uh, sexual acts with women. So. Well, it's, you know, what's crazy about that is that's an emotional pain mm -hmm. and trauma yep. undealt with that elicited, right, some kind of coping. Yeah through sexual means, yeah. but it can be anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like if we obviously look to something that's powerful enough mm -hmm. to numb, suppress, or cope, yeah. right? And sex just happens to be one of the, mm -hmm. the many. You feel like being in the NFL, um, I feel like there's maybe a lot of cultural Christianity amongst athletes. Okay, yeah. And I'm, you know, I've never played in the NFL. Yeah. <laughs> I played in yeah. <laughs> Europe, but gotcha. <laughs> it's not much to brag about. <laughs> But cultural Christianity, right, in the NFL, like, so you have a guy who maybe claims to be something, but every city you go to, you know, you might have a baby mama. Mm -hmm. You feel like your sexual ethic and the people that you were surrounded with for those five, six, seven years out of college impacted how you viewed the life as a Christian, or were there enough Christians around you in those moments of life? That no, no, I, 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 I had the um, intelligence or the knowledge, you know, like, all right, this person really walking it out. Like uh, when I was on the Giants, a guy by the name of Prince Mukamur, Prince walked it out. Yes. He waited all See, the way. See, defensive yeah. end? He's the back. He's the DB, back. yeah. Yeah, he actually sponsored me for this thing called PAO, Pro Athletes Outreach, my first time. So cool. So I, I know Prince was really walking that thing out. Uh, when I was on the Chargers, a guy by the name of Hunter Henry. Yeah, tight end. Uh, yeah, yes, Hunter was walking that thing out. So I knew the guys are really doing you walking out their faith. And I remember when I first got to the league, I was trying my best to stay attached to Prince. And around going into my first offseason, that's when I figured out about that situation with my ex in college. Yeah. That's when I kind of was like detached myself and trying to live this worldly life. Um, but ultimately, yes, yes, I can under, I can really see who's really a Christian by, I'll have to say, the fruits of their life. Like, yeah. How they really walking this thing up. And did that really help you kind of model your life? Like, would you say being surrounded with a guy like Torrance, maybe yeah. a guy like, because one thing that always happened to me in my story is, I always felt like I was the top of the waterfall mm -hmm. and that was the worst thing for me mm -hmm. as far as spiritually, yeah. emotionally, maturity wise. It, Cause it, it just kept me so arrogant in my walk. Yeah. I hear these guys yeah. who are like germ, like I love you, bro, yeah. but you got to lock in. Yeah. You got to level up. Yeah. Like even when your dating life and your single life, you felt like that until that happened, mm -hmm. you weren't able to lock in. I was just, again, I was just coping as much as I can until that situation happened. Then I was like, I need to lock in. And like I said, having friends like like my boy T-Wade, because like I said, him and his wife didn't live together prior to being married. They didn't sleep together. 
I was like, man, this is influential. And I love, I believe it's when Paul says, be imitators of me because I am of Christ. Like my, I seen my boy, you know, walk that out. So that's why, you know, for this part of my life, I was always leaning on him. Like, pray for us, bro. Like, it's a lot of frustration. Boom, boom. I remember me and my now wife went to Sedona. Him and my pastor, probably within an hour from, uh, apart from each other, it was like, honor Erica, bro. Don't sleep with her. And there was no plans of doing that. But the fact they care so much yeah. about my purity, bro, just showed me like, and, oh, this and, is love. And when you say sleep with her, you're even meeting like spending the night mm-hmm. in the same bed. Yes. Not even like the casual term for sex of yeah. sleeping with her. Anything, even, bro, because like, I'm, I'm not strong enough to lay in the same bed as her. I'm really, really not. And that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. I should struggle <laughs> laying next to my wife, now wife, and saying like, I just got to have you. <laughs> and uh, like I said, Pastor Will Sullivan and my boy Torrance, they were they were huge, huge, huge uh, in being accountability partners. We have a great pastor friend and people ask him about cohabitation and sleeping together all the time. And uh, it's oftentimes girls are asking, like, my boyfriend wants to sleep with me. Is it okay? Mm-hmm. And he's like, if your boyfriend claims that he can sleep beside you and not touch you sexually, you should be offended. That's an issue. <laughs> he That's an issue. Because you should be offended. Yes. And he shouldn't want to be all over you in, right. in a way. You know, yeah. and he means it as a joking way. For sure. Right. To say, like, it's just kind of foolish yeah. to say, I'm attracted to you, but I also think I can sleep in the same bed next yeah. to you. Yeah. Now, we don't, we we could talk about physical boundaries mm-hmm. on heart of dating all the time, but we really don't talk about it that often. But I love it when we do. It's so sweet. You know, yeah, like yeah. we can't hammer it every single time we talk to a guest. Yeah. But I love the fact that we've gone here because it's always relevant. Yes. Right. Absolutely. It's always relevant. Do you feel like when you were single and dating, there was this kind of relaxed ethic, sexual ethic around, especially sleeping together? And what changed that for you? like in your mind and heart on top of someone just challenging you to not do it? I, th- I think, again, being having the humility to pray for the fruits of the Spirit and pray yeah. for self-control because I don't have self-control around my wife. Bro. Did you think it was wrong uh, when you would sleep or like when, when people maybe in your Christian community, because here's what I see a lot. Mm. I see a lot of 34, 37, mm. 39-year-olds who, quote, claim the more mature they are in their faith – the more it's just kind of okay. Mm-hmm. And like the 22 year olds get the, hey, no sleeping together, no cuddling and grinding underneath the covers. Yeah. You know, like that's, you know, what you guys need to learn. And then you might have these people who've kind of in their mind graduated. Yeah. Hey, we're 39. We're going to go vacation with each other, right? To Mexico yeah. and we're going to sleep in the same bed. Yeah. And we're not going to have sex. And some of them don't even have sex, yeah. you know. For sure. But it, more power to you, I guess. Well, yeah. I guess. But still, um, do you feel like you maybe started to see that as you got older and some of the Christians around yeah, you? Yeah, man. I just, when it comes to, I guess, dabbling in like the cohabitating part, I'm just like, how is this reflective? Like, because cause you're, if I see you living together, your perception is, oh, they're probably sleeping together. And I don't even want to have the perception of sin. Right. By no means. Now, people might think that that take that I just has weak, but I'm just like, bro, if we really care about reflecting the gospel, which should be our priority, then that, that take isn't weak. And uh, I think a lot of times we just allow certain things in our lives to unintentionally become idols, like cohabitating. It's cool. You know, we still go to church together and stuff, but, you know, we go back to our beds and we sleep together. Yeah. And then, like, if I encourage then you should marry that girl. It's like, oh, I got to make sure I want to marry her. But like, you're playing house. You're sleeping together. You're paying for all this stuff. But, but now this, like, it's, yeah. like it, it, it just, and like I said, it's tough because I'm having these conversations with people that I fellowship with. You know what I'm saying? And the same thing I'm saying, I would hope that you would say to me whatever sin I'm doing. And if I get defensive about it, you need to check me, bro. Because obviously there's an issue, especially if what I'm saying is aligned with the same foundation and biblical teachings that we both read. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, um, you know, Matthew 19, like if you have an offense or, you know, you see an issue in a fellow brother's life, approach him in private. Mm-hmm. If that doesn't work, come in a group of two, yep, yep. right? And then if yeah, that doesn't bring work, bring the pastor. Yeah, bring in the whole church yeah. because it, it is a problem. And I think, you know, we talked about it briefly and we're going to talk about it on your episode. I think cohabitation for me is so funny or sleeping together. I, I think the topic of sleeping together as Christians is actually somehow maybe 
not talked about enough right. because it's kind of vague. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. and for me, I think biblical wisdom and, and, and spiritual maturity knows what is right and wrong when the rules don't apply. Mm. Okay. Yeah. The Bible doesn't have clear rules yeah. on weed. Yeah. Okay, the Bible doesn't have clear rules on nicotine or addictive behavior. Yeah. Okay, the Bible doesn't really have clear rules on dating mm-hmm. and sleeping together, yeah. just sleeping in the same bed. Yeah. That's where wisdom and spiritual maturity comes into play in our everyday life. I forgot who told me this term. Maybe it was my pastor. I always try to give him credit because he'd just be dropping wisdom on me. But uh, it was this term I heard called sin ushers. That necessary that that's not necessarily say that written in scripture, but it leads you into sin. Sin so, ushers. Sin ushers. Like you know, how usher leads you. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, yeah, we're just gonna lay together, but that's a sin usher because now I'm just laying together. Now we grind over each other. Now yes. Kissing, now my hands going down there and all this type of stuff. So it's just leading you. Um, that's a great way to yeah, put it. Yeah, dog. I thought that was a bar. I think it was my past, but whoever told me that I'm gonna say it's him. <laughs> sin ushers just like. Well, you know, we one thing we, I say is uh, invited temptation and uninvited temptation, mm-hmm. meaning sometimes you are on Instagram, you're on a social media platform, you're at the beach or at your gym, and there's just something there that you really don't mm-hmm. want to see, yeah. especially sexually yeah. with another female and her body and stuff. There are just some instances in life where we, just by living in the world, not of the world, but right. in the world, yes, yes, yes. there's uninvited temptation. Mm-hmm. Invited temptation is different. Mm. I still follow the booty account. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or I, I still go on Twitter and Reddit uh-huh. and I know what lurks on the for you pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not really seeking it out, but I'm inviting temptation. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Genesis talks about the idea in Genesis three that or uh, actually I think it's five with Cain and Abel and, mm. and God says, Sin is crouching at your door, mm. crouching, waiting for yeah. you to what? Yeah. I get goosebumps thinking about it just opening that door right just crack and get a little bit mm-hmm. that's how sin is just waiting at right. every moment right. for us to just leave a little crack absolutely absolutely i think that's huge too man and i mean obviously like i said i've rambled about the, the the self-control piece but like we we have to be aware that you know sin is lurking to get us man and i think it talks about in james 14 it says humble yourself for the lord and exalt you like to have the humility be like lord help me in this situation because exhaustion comes from that. But I think a lot of times we don't want to ask for humility, which, again, goes back to what I said in asking about, Lord, help bring me the fruits of the Spirit. Yes. Because we want to be able to fall to our flesh. Uh-huh. And then if something happens because we fall to our flesh, it's like, oh, God, come to me. I need you as my my Savior. Did yeah. He's good. All right, back to what I'm doing. I'll call you next time. And if sin is just consistently working, I mean, lurking, you're going to always be calling out to God. But yeah. I think that the true fruits, man, is... Truly surrendering to Christ, eternal salvation, bro. And again, I'm, I, I I say that I'm sure you are on the same tip as me is because we really, really care about the destination of your soul. We really do. Um, and I think fruits of the spirit is just such a huge thing that, to ask for, especially because, like you said, sin is sitting there waiting. Right waiting. now, if you had a a, y- a young man listen to this, mm-hmm. maybe he's like 25 year old germ, mm-hmm. you know, and he's just like going back and forth mm-hmm. right with like an a uh, uh, um, a challenge with addictive sin mm-hmm. or a challenge with physical boundaries mm-hmm. or a challenge in not confessing and finding an accountability partner mm-hmm. what advice would you give him listening and like what would have worked with you besides a girl you know stabbing you with like a truth dagger mm-hmm. in the soul i always say a thing like this like is god really number one in your life or is it like there's something politically correct you say. Like, if you truly believe God's number one, which a lot of times we say this, it's like we need to really, really walk out what that means. And secondly, I think it's in Matthew 20, 22, he said, what is the most important commandment? To love your, your God with all your heart and all your soul. Then he goes on to say the second is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And if I truly, truly love my neighbor, like then, again, how am I honoring that female if I'm claiming to love my neighbor? If it's just like the first, which is loving your God with all your heart and all your soul. That is one thing that really, really convicted me. And that was KB that pointed that out to me. When you look at it, it says and the, the second is like the first. And if we truly believe in that and God's really first, then we would obviously honor him first, but also love our neighbor, which is just like the first. 
Yeah. I mean, even as you said that, I mean, it's like depending on what part that you hear that verse so many times. Mm -hmm. I'm like, depending on what point is emphasized, your soul is always just kind of like, man, that's Mm -hmm. good. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I heard a a pastor break down as yourself Mm -hmm. and just the significance of Mm -hmm. the ability to love yourself as God created you because he loves you, Mm -hmm. not because of anything you've done and to be able to walk in that acceptance. Because how can you love your neighbor if you don't know what it's like to experience love yourself? How can you love your neighbor and and learn what it's like to lay down your life for your neighbor? If you've never experienced Jesus is laying down of his life and his love for you, right? So the loving of self is not the loving of self of the world, right? Mm. The glorification of self. But I let the, the, the second is as the first. It's yes. almost it's as important. Yes. To and but you know, there's so many times, Jim, in my single life and even my life in day to day where I'm just like, I feel like it's the Holy Spirit just kind of like questioning. It's just um, hey man, if I looked at your life today and you said that God is your top priority, mm. how did how did your day reflect that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Bro, that's that's, that's true, man. I think well, I think we were talking about too when we did our little practice round of golf. It's like one of the scariest things to say is like you cast it out and healed in my name, but I never knew you. So like, man, how does that really look to walk that out? Yeah, and let God literally lead you throughout the day. And how does it look also to again, I'm saying the same term, have the humility to surrender to Him throughout my day? How does that really look? And again. If we see in our life a tree bearing good fruits, then we can see that like, okay, he's really walking it out. Yes. Because a good tree won't bear bad fruits. Right. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit because mm-hmm. one thing that I love about you is you're actually super passionate, mm-hmm. especially I can tell, and we actually haven't known each other that long, mm-hmm. but I can tell you're really passionate and you really want to be excellent in the things that you try. Mm-hmm. You practice, you practice a new golf move, a golf Get drill. Up. Every single day, uh, every single day, you work out five days a week, Mm -hmm. you consume, what's your sugar macro? I just try to really have a low sugar intake. Him and my wife failed me today making me eat this donut, so they were a stumbling block. But uh, no, I try to to have- (laughs) Was it worth it? It it was good. It was good. Nothing compares to Good Town Donuts in Costa Mesa, I will say that, but it was good though. Okay. Good donut. But I try to eat low sugar meals. Yeah. Okay. So, sure. But I love how passionate you are. Mm-hmm. And and let's be honest, golf is probably one of the most fun sports for you, <laughs> yes. for myself. Yes. yes. I don't think, you know, not every guy listening, this is not a golf channel. For sure. For sure. But they all have that one thing that they just love. Mm-hmm. Have you ever wrestled? So whatever it is for you listening, think about that one thing, that one hobby activity that just brings you Mm -hmm. so much pleasure. Have you ever wrestled with the question that is golf an idol for me? This is what I would say. I I wouldn't say that I question if it's an idol for me, but I consistently remind myself that, like I said from my channel, that the gospel is the priority. Like, okay, I just double bogey, the gospel's priority. I just birdied, the gospel's priority, no matter what I do. And I love what it says in 1 Corinthians one thirty one. it says, like the one who boasts, boasts in Christ. And I want to make sure that I'm consistently doing that, even in the game of golf. And I have to make sure, too, with intentions, that the same time and effort I put into going to the range. Yes. Obviously, doing stuff in my backyard in the putting green. Yes. Or the feed golf two game that I'm also doing in my word, being in constant conversation with Christ. Yes. Reaching out to friends for prayer and for me to pray for them and reaching out to my friends for praise reports too when something is answered and being very, very intentional about my walk with Christ um, with more than what I'm doing with the game of golf. And I love playing golf. It's super fun. I also love the Lord. Right. But you, but I, I, I mean, here's the question, you know, um, I go out and I spend eight hours on the range mm-hmm. playing. Mm-hmm. Maybe I play 36. Mm-hmm. I, I head up the clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reminding myself after a birdie, a bogey, hey, it's all about the gospel. Mm-hmm. Is there ever even that point though, where you're like, even as I do the activity, I can find a way to glorify God, but if I'm doing this seven days a week, is there even still a point where I'm using the gospel to justify an activity That's good. that I just really enjoy and love? That's good. And I just yeah. throw God into the mix, yeah. you know. So again, I'm very, very intentional about that. It also says in First Corinthians ten thirty one, so whether you eat, whether you drink, or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Yeah. Even if that's a double bogey, 
that seems weird, right? Like how you get a double bogey for the glory of God. And now the beauty, of, the beauty about it is because He loves us unconditionally. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter what we score, no matter what we score. And I, it gives me more joy to bring Him into that because He doesn't care. Now, granted, yes, I'm competitive. I prefer a double over a triple or bogey over a double and so on so on. <laughs> quad. It's competitive nature. Oh, quad. <laughs> but the fact that I consistently know and, and the word of Christ dwells in me richly and know that he loves me unconditionally, I mean, of course I'm going to bring him into that situation all the time. And I want to make sure, again, as I'm doing that, I'm walking that up. Well, you know, as I think about that, I'm like, do you see that carry over into the rest of your life? Meaning mm. then you go to the gym, you go to Exos, yeah. you go to... A, uh, a football game, like, and that habit of, hey, did this glorify God? How can I glorify God? Mm-hmm. Is kind of like your bullseye all day long. Like that is your chief aim yeah. all day long. Yeah. You know what's great about what you said too? And again, I keep bringing up Torrance because he does golf and gospel with me. There are times where he's playing bad or I'm playing bad. And it's just like, hey, bro, what's the priority? To have someone remind you of that. And I love what it says in First Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore encourage each other and build each other up. Because uh-huh. so, sometimes I might fail. You it. guys do a great job at that. Yes, that's my dog, man. And, and sometimes we fail at that. But it's like, how do we uplift each other when one of us is down or one of us just had this type of... Well, you know, you know? what's crazy is I, I think about that and it just reminds me, I'm like, there are times in my life mm-hmm. where like we bring up God and it's almost like, why would you bring that up now? Like, this is fun time. Yeah. We're playing golf. Why would you bring up the gospel and my identity in Christ? Well, the thing is, which is awesome that you guys are going there. Yeah, because your identity in Christ is what's most important. Even in, yeah, there's there's no place in my life yeah. that is like spiritual time, fun time, and not separate. Inten- yeah, yeah, they're all they all they, God is encompassing all that. If if we truly believe that He's an omnipresent God, He's He's indwelling in all of that, and. Like I said, t- at times we let that slip out, but it's good to have a brother in Christ who's reminding you, like, he's still here. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I think at like eight o'clock at night, I'm mm-hmm. decompressing with my wife, we're watching a movie, and it's like, that time is not off limits mm-hmm. to remind each other, like, if we slip up and had a, a, a curse word or snapped mm-hmm. at each other, it's yeah. like, that's not a time where we just say, oh, we're tired, we're decompressing, like, let's write it off. That's even a time. Mm-hmm. And there's time on the golf course. There's time at the coffee shop. Ooh. Like there's just time. I just think about the most, I think about the most mundane mm-hmm. or I think about the most pleasure filled fun moments of my life. And those are probably the two areas where I'm just like, I'm not now. Like mm-hmm. I'm not going to preach on my wife now. Wow. You know? Yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think with situations like that, it becomes not how you vocally present it, but it's how, how, how it's lived out at that moment. Cause sometimes it's like, oh, she probably doesn't feel like hearing that, or I probably don't feel like hearing that. Yeah. But one thing my wife always says, and sometimes I'm confused, but one thing she always says is when situations happen, like, come comfort her and love her. You know, I can't just be like, well, you know, scripture says, like, boom, boom, boom. It's like, yes, the word is very powerful, it's <laughs> yes. very true, but like, how about I express compassion and hope just like Christ would do me? Right. Yeah. Ephesians 5. Yes, yes. That's good. It's good. Amen. Well, and the when I the best way I heard that is, you know, Paul is explaining, and this is for all the single men listening, because mm-hmm. these moments are coming. Right. When Paul says to love your wives, first of all, as Christ loved the church, mm-hmm. right, which means die in every way, willing to give up yourself. Right. Yes. It's easy. We all say like, I, I, we're talking about this, right? Because she moved into the house first, and then you had to go live at her <laughs> yeah. rinky dinky apartment. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, funny. What's funny, Jerry, is um, we all say that we'll take a bullet for a woman, mm-hmm. and you guys will say that when you meet the the woman of your dreams, mm-hmm. and you're ignited for her, right. and you'll say, "I'll take a bullet for you gladly." Mm-hmm. But when it comes to die to preferences, we I can be such a baby, yeah, and so concerned about myself, yeah. And I'm like, though, I will say, I'll claim, mm-hmm. I'll take a bullet for you. But when real life happens in the most mundane, mm-hmm. small, inconvenient things, yeah. I huff and puff, mm-hmm. and I might as well want to take a bullet, yeah, <laughs> you know, point, yeah, then yeah. have to sacrifice yeah. another little thing. Yeah, yeah, man. That, yeah, that was a, a funny interaction we had because, um, like I said, I want. I was like, okay, I'll move into the house first, and then when we get married, you move in. And there's this whole thing about I want to feel like this, this, and that, and then I'm just like, all right, so so did you move in first? And <laughs> yeah, this, and she ended up being here first, but um, but that's the, you but know, that's but, the sacrifice piece. Like, okay, I'll be the one to have to leave and drive 20 minutes, go yes. to the apartment, 
do this, this, and that. Um, and that's, but that's the honor yes, of yes. biblical masculinity yes. is what? Yes. We get to go first. Mm -hmm. We get to go first when we run to the cross. Mm -hmm. We get to first, we get to go first to say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We get to go first and saying, no, 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 honey, you, let's do it that way. Yeah. And we'll sacrifice this way. Yes, yes, yes. The best way I ever heard that said was, you know, prioritizing her needs is what your call is, mm -hmm. you know, to cherish her and love her and mm -hmm. prioritize her. It doesn't mean your needs don't matter. Yeah. It just means that hers get prioritized over yours in yeah. that moment. He, he know, Meaning I'm, you have needs after the fact. And I'm happy you said that because obviously with the eating situation that we're in, and I'm always trying to look out. Which is what? My, my wife's vegan and I always try. And I know she's she her heart means super well with this, but she always like I'm a burden because of this. It's like you're not a burden. I want to make you feel comfortable. Let's find somewhere where best suits your eating preferences. And I think she understands that, but I, yeah, she just feels like she's a burden, but she, she's not. And I'm always trying to affirm it. You're not a burden. You're not a burden. Like we can. And you place. mean it. And I do. I do, bro. <laughs> she don't believe. Me, bro. She does not yeah. believe me, bro. Well, uh, has yeah. there ever been anything in your life that? You just needed a little bit more time and consistency to see that they actually mean what they say they mean. I, th I think in this situation is different because like our personalities are just totally different. Yeah. Like if you say it, I'm gonna be like, well, all right. <laughs> Versus her, it's like she just probably just needs a bit more, which is fine. And again, that's my job to make sure that I'm affirming yeah. those things and whatnot. <laughs> so I think just based off our different personalities, is what's required. Yeah. So Brene Brown, she's like a TED Talk girl. Okay. Um, TED Talk, not TikTok. Yeah, TED Talk, Talk girl. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, she's like in her 50s. <laughs> so I shouldn't say girl. Yeah. Uh, female. <laughs> um, she talks about trust. And she says the best way to think about trust is have a marble jar. Mm -hmm. And every time, especially this is important in dating, mm -hmm. right? When people are claiming to be something and then you actually put their words on mute, look mm -hmm. at their actions and build trust over time. Mm -hmm. um, every time they do something that builds trust, you put a marble in the marble jar. Wow. And then over time, right, more actions, mm -hmm. more trust is built, and you have more marbles in yes. the jar. Yes. You might just have a small jar, and she has a really, really big yeah. one. You know, it's you funny. Know? It's funny. My <laughs> pastor said this, man. He said, treat affirming your wife or loving your wife like there is a hole in the bucket and just keep filling it up. Yeah. And it's not that she needs it or, or whatnot or like she's self-conscious or anything, but just like, Keep filling the bucket up because obviously where there's a little hole in it's going to keep leaking out, but keep filling it up and keep her filled. Did up. you hear that in premarital or? Yes, premarital yeah, okay. counseling told us that because I ain't going to front like I lack um, words of affirmation. I've always been like that. I don't know why. So it makes me uncomfortable sometimes. So like, and not to say my wife does not make me always say it, but I don't know at times it's just like, do I have to say you look good right now or do I have to do that? And again, I have to die to myself. I let her know, like, you look good today. Yeah. Or I remember my pastor said, this it should be a sin if your your lady gets all dressed up, makeup, come out in heels, and you don't tell her she's beautiful. Wow. It should be a sin. Uh, <laughs> so I, I have to treat loving my wife like it's a bucket with a hole in it and just keep on affirming her and loving, yeah. her, loving her, loving her. Yeah. And, you know, that I think every guy, I think every human being can relate to loving someone in their love language. Mm -hmm. Right. There's been really great books written on this, mm -hmm. but loving someone the way that they want to be loved mm -hmm. is one of the most loving things yeah. we can do. Absolutely. And that's challenging. It is. Because my wife's love language is me cleaning and mopping yeah. and, you know, romanticizing her. She's mm -hmm. like a romantic crackhead. Yeah. So she loves to be more romanticized and mm -hmm. taken out on date night. Mm -hmm. And I, once we got married, I stopped dating her the way I dated her mm. and singleness. Yeah. And, and we'll close on this. Um, I'll give you a piece of advice mm -hmm. and then you give a piece of advice yeah. for all the singles listening. Yeah. But if there's one piece of advice is pray for God. You know, I would always pray. And one of the pieces of Kate and I's story mm. is God, would you ignite my heart for the one that you have for me? That's good. Right. Based on song of Solomon's and mm -hmm. do not stir or awaken love before it is time to awaken which is sexually and spiritually like God don't ignite my heart for the right woman mm -hmm. until it's the right time. That's good. And she was praying the same prayer for years in advance. Mm -hmm. We both prayed the same prayer. And you know what, Jeremy, I stopped praying that prayer when I met her. Wow. And it makes me so sad mm -hmm. because that prayer never stops. Yeah, absolutely. 
not when you get engaged, yeah. not when you get married. Your kids, all that. Yeah. Yep. And so a prayer that I've been praying recently and months because I was so convicted and made me so sad was, God, would you keep my heart ignited for the one that you have for me? Mm-hmm. That's good. You know, and, um, but mine for you, or my question for you, <laughs> and I hope single, I talk about marriage. We talk about marriage on Heart of Dating because mm-hmm. I think it's, and what we've heard it's helpful yeah. to kind of talk about where you're going and learning some of these lessons as a single man, mm-hmm. right? So that when you are dating, when you are engaged, it is helpful to know how to love and cherish the woman in front of you, mm-hmm. maybe just in a different way. But what would your advice be to single men listening and let's maybe cater it towards honoring and loving the girl That's, yeah, yeah. before you get married. So this is the thing, too, because I have some friends, bro. Um, when me and Erica got married, they're like, yes, the goal, that's the goal. But the life that you're living is not reflecting that that's the goal for you. Like if you just had a one night stand or you're constantly still womanizing, that doesn't doesn't show that the goal is marriage for you. You're still in, in a childlike ways. So if that's truly, truly the goal for you, then start walking a life that shows that you want to be a godly husband yeah let's go man absolutely bro that was off the top of your head or did you write that down before no nah, no nah, it's, it's off the top but i just I, i've seen and experienced my friends saying it and i only say that because i do love them and i do believe that's the goal for you but your 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 actions aren't reflecting your words by, by by no means yep. and i want that for you so i hope if my friends do watch this that that challenge them and that pierces them right in their heart and they start to walk in a manner that's reflective of the gospel. Worthy of their calling. Worthy of your calling. That's reflective Ephesians. Reflective gospel and, and, and to be a future godly husband. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Absolutely, man. This, this was, was so fun, much fun. Dog. Yes. I love it, man. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, bro. Yes, sir.